and there probably could be many more um, sessions on this topic, could be an intervention in and of itself for these children, but um, especially working in the school setting, it um, can be very useful to spend some time practicing organization and study skills. Um, <clears throat> So there are a number of um, activities that um, can be used to help the students practice, both recognizing the importance of organization and the um, way it can be useful for them personally, and then also thinking about their study skills and how it can help um, them learn and get the grades that they would like to. Um, so the first activity um, is a game in which we ask the children to bring their backpacks to the group. If, they're, if that's not something that they typically do, you want to make sure the, the session before to um, ask them to bring their backpacks to the group um, for your upcoming session. And um, the, what we do to start is to have a list of um, a few things that uh, should be found in um, a typical student's backpack. So it could be something like a pencil, um, a blank piece of paper, um, a math worksheet, um, a list of assignments, homework assignments for the next day. And um, you uh, ask the students to race. Say, we're going to play a game, and we're going to race. And we're going to see who can find um, these four things in their backpack the fastest. Ready, set, go. And you let them kind of go through their bags and race and race. And if you have a stopwatch, you can use a stopwatch to time them. And make note of um, how long it takes each child to find um, the items in their backpack. And then after everyone has found all of the objects, you can take some time to process how that went. Who won the game? Who found those items the quickest? Let's look in their bag and see what it looks like. Um, and then you can compare their bag to the person who took the longest and see if the two bags look similar or different as far as how organized they are, where they keep things, if there are a lot of extra papers or unnecessary items uh, in their backpack. So it's kind of a fun way of introducing this concept of how um, being organized or not can make things easier or more difficult for you to find. Um, and then after you play that game, um, it can be useful to actually spend some time helping each child in the group organize their backpack. Um, so kind of dig into the bottom of their backpack, pick up all the broken pencils or pens, um, put those together into one particular uh, zipper pouch or, or part of their bag. Um, look in the bottom of the bag, see if there were um, notes that their parent was supposed to sign and return a week ago and <laughs> see where they could put that to remember to take it home that night. See if there are toys or crushed papers or things that they don't need that could be tossed or set aside. Um, try to collect all of their papers for each subject and either put them in divider tabs or in a folder for that class. So spend some time really practicing concrete things that they can do to organize their um, backpack and find things for, um, for each subject more readily. And then after you've taken 10 to 15 minutes to do that and help each student um, organize their backpack, you can play the game again and either come up with the same or different list of items and have them race to find it in their backpack. And then each child can compare their time to see if, um, if organizing their bag a little bit, getting rid of the things they didn't need and, and putting everything in its place help them to find things more readily. So it's meant to be kind of a fun activity that helps them practice organization. Um, and also recognize how that can make their own life easier, can help them win the game or find things more quickly. And um, then there are several other activities that um, we have some separate slides on that we'll go through. Um, but first, we try to use the, the backpack activity to raise um, some discussion about um, why organization is important. So we'll ask the students, like, what, you know, what are some of the skills you think that it takes to do well in school? And um, try to foster some discussion that doing your work, turning in your assignments um, is important. And in that case, knowing what your assignments are and being able to find them and turn them in are important steps in that process. Um, so you can foster some discussion around that. And um, also about the fact that um, a lot of times the conflict with the teacher or even with the parents could be around, um, you know, missing assignments or missing work. 
and that being a little more organized, being able to keep track of their assignments and turn it in could actually improve their relationship with their teacher or their parents as well. And it could actually reduce their own sense of frustration or irritability with their schoolwork as well. So we try to build the sense of um, kind of rationale of how this can be kind of personally useful to each child. And um, then we have another organizational game that we play. So we actually brought props to play this game. So if I could have um, about three volunteers to come to the front and play this game, it would be great. Anybody willing to come up? Thank you. We have one. How about two more? That's a fine one. Two? Okay, great. Okay, super. Thank you to our three volunteers. So what we have here is um, a stack of cards. This is an identical set for each of our lovely volunteers here. And so what I might say is, you know, we've been talking about organization and how it can be helpful too. So today we're going to play a game. Y'all like games? Yes. Okay. So today we're going to play games. <laughs> <laughs> so you're each going to get your own set of cards here. Okay. So let me just realize these are already too organized. We need to mess them up. So you would, you would, so? Yeah. You wouldn't mind just blindly shuffling them to start. That would be great. You and I shuffling them some more, that'd be great. So what we're going to do is... Kind of gave us an answer. Um, what did you say? <laughs> that kind of gave us an answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is in just a minute, I want you to look through all of the cards in your stack and see if you can put it into some kind of order. You can organize it in some way that will be helpful to you. It can be any way you want to see if you can come up with a way to organize it. Okay? And take about a minute to do that, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next. Okay? Go ahead and organize your or Just make sure you don't mix them up with your neighbor's cards. Different way, and then we'll erase again. 
Oh, we're going to race again? <laughs> For now, just organize <laughs> And you can talk about the fact that there's not necessarily a right way to do it or a right way to be organized. It's just a matter of taking the time to um, to look at what you have and put it in some kind of order that can be helpful and make your life easier. Um, so these were the words that they were looking at. So this is how they might appear if they really weren't organized at all. Um, <clears throat> this is how they might look if you put them by color. And... okay. Yeah, you were quite impressive because you found them quickly when actually that um, may not be a very help and could even slow you down. <laughs> See? Uh, this is how they might look alphabetical. A for apple, B, baseball, B, basketball, B, bear. And then um, the categories, we had fruits, transportation, sports, and animals. 
Um, but y'all did a great job coming up with not all of the children do. It's a little more of a savvy concept for them to be able to um, think categorically like that. So often one or two children in the group come up with that, but not all of them. So it's meant to be a fun activity to introduce the concept of how spending a brief amount of time getting organized can make, um, make your life easier and help you find what you're looking for. And then we have um, another activity in which um, there's a list of study skills for home and school, which are also printed in your manual for this session. And what we often do is print them onto um, small cards that the students can do a card sort with. And so you can read each study skill one at a time and have them put them into a pile of things they think would help them study and do well in school or things that they think would be unhelpful. Or you can have them kind of do a thumbs up and thumbs down in the group. Um, and then after they've kind of sorted the cards into the pile, they can talk about each one and why it's useful or not and how they can um, do a better job of using the positive study skills and maybe stop doing some of the negative study skills. Um, and then also ask them to come up with their own ideas for things that can help them study and learn as well. So we can go through a few of these. So would you say it's a thumbs up or thumbs down thing to do to ask your parent to check over your homework? You know, thumbs up, okay. How about try to keep everything in your head without writing it down? Thumbs down, okay, so why is that a thumbs down? Okay, so it's hard to do. You might think you'll remember it, but then forget. Okay. How about break big projects into steps and do one step each day? Okay, so why is that a good thing to do? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the parents. So you avoid um, telling them at 9 o'clock at night that they need to go to the store and get a poster board for a project the next day. Um, so it can... More qualitative work. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they may learn at a deeper level if they space it out over time and decrease their stress and conflict. It's, it's achievable and it's not overwhelming. And they'll mm -hmm. feel successful in just that small bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it makes it feel more achievable rather than so overwhelming that it's hard to even get started. Uh, how about study with students who are not serious students? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down. Okay, why is that a thumbs down? Well, that's okay, so they might start goofing off or get off task. How about study in bed? Thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> why, why would you say thumbs down? <laughs> Yeah, it's okay to have some discussion around some of these. So some kids may hear that you remember things better if you learn them right before you fall asleep. But what's the risk if you get into bed and you're nice and snuggly and warm? You might fall asleep and not study at all. Um, do your work as fast as you can. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, so why is that a thumbs down? Okay, you can do a sloppy job, make careless mistakes, maybe not learn it as well. Make sure that you've written down all of your assignments accurately. Your thumbs up, so why is that a good thing to do? Okay, so you make sure that you, um, so that you can get full credit and get it right. You want to make sure that you've written it down properly. Take notes in class. Thumbs up, so why is that a good idea? Uh huh. The, the process of taking notes can often help us remember key points or help us learn. The younger the elementary students you work with, the more foreign this concept is. They're like third, fourth, fifth graders even don't necessarily have a lot of practice taking notes in class. So it's something that you can discuss. Talk on the phone while studying. Okay, so the, that, that's again where you could have some discussion. So if you're studying together, that's great. If you start talking about the dance coming up and forget to get your work done, that might not be so great. Well, that's where it's helpful after you've kind of gone through this activity like we've done to go back through the cards in the positive pile and say, how do you think you could um, do more of these than you already are and see if they could spontaneously say, actually, I maybe need to take a 30-minute break from texting, get my work done, and then I can do it again. 
So if they can actually generate some of that themselves, they may be more motivated to do it. So that's where that follow-up discussion and trying to get them to commit to working on a few of these things more themselves can be really powerful. So you're just scheduling, scheduling in those kind of moments. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the way the manual reads is to first kind of go through and, and have them sort these into piles. Um, and then to follow it up with discussion about how they could do more of the positive study skills and do fewer of the negative study skills. And part of that discussion can be asking each of them to describe a few specific changes that they think they could use to make. So that's actually kind of written into the outline for this session. So here, here's an example of some that we've been going through. And this is also a page in the child uh, workbook that you have. So they have um, some of these to look at in their workbook as well. I believe so, yes. What page are you looking at? I think that's it, yep. Right, the, the page in the workbook actually is not as exhaustive, and this is actually not as exhaustive of a list as what we have on these cards or what the, your manual has um, a detailed list. So the students actually don't get the list with quite as many as you have, so it would be fine for them to write those down on that page, the additional one. The, on page 35 in the lead, 75 in the leader's guide has the full list. And then another activity that appears in the child manual, um, it, often if you're running the parent component at the same time as the child component, we like to streamline these in time. Um, so at, if, if you're running the parent component at the same time, the first parent topic is um, the things that they can do to foster their child's academic success, um, the things that they can do at home including coming up with a plan for when and where the child does their homework each day and what structures will be in place. Um, so it's great if you're running the parent component to be talking with the parent about that around the time that this activity appears in the um, child program. But we've included it in the child program also uh, because it can be done as a homework assignment with the child to um, assign them the homework assignment of going and talking to their parent um, and to kind of work together collaboratively to fill out this homework contract and negotiate when and where they do their homework each day. So are they allowed to have a snack or play for a little bit when they come home or do they need to get started on their homework right away? Are they going to work independently or is their parent going to be with them? Um, or are they going to work on their own and then have their parent check their work? And also, how are they going to keep track of what their assignments are so they can communicate with their parent about that? Um, so if you were running only the child program, you could talk this through with the child about the conversation that you hope for them to have with their parent and then um, award them points for bringing this back to the next session filled out and signed by both um, them and their parent also trying to know what their parent's signature looks like before you award points for that. And so that's the end of the um, activities on the organization and study skills. And it's really just one session in the beginning of the program that's repeated um, later in the program. But again, it's um, a set of activities that these children could really use. So if you had an opportunity to have more sessions or if this was a really strong area of need for a particular client, it would be worth devoting more time to than, than one or two sessions here. Any comments or questions about those activities before we go on to the next topic? Okay, I'm going to turn it back over. Um, so now we're going to go into the third uh, thematic area of the program and focuses on emotion and on children's um, awareness of emotion. Um, their understanding of different types of emotion, their understanding of different um, degrees of emotion, their understanding of what causes emotion, so kind of a variety of things that are all uh, emotion related. So some of the tips for clinicians that we like to keep in mind as we go in here, this is for, for us. So um, uh, the children that we work with often are at 
one extreme or the other. So they're either at the first bullet or the, or the third bullet here. So either they're kids who have difficulty seeing a range of emotional arousal. So they'll describe things that are happening in their lives as events, as uh, problems that have come up, uh, things that have happened, problems in the bus, problems at, uh, in the hallway at school. And uh, as you listen to their description, there's very little emotion in there. So it's kind of absent. So it's a very concrete uh, thing. So for those children, as we're working through these couple of sessions, we really are trying to do some very basic enhancement of their ability to talk about emotion. So it's kind of like they're developmentally delayed. They're not quite as far along as other children should be at this time. But there are other children at this third bullet that are the reverse. So they, everything is emotion. So you say, uh, how did things go today? It was awful. Uh, why was it awful? I was angry. Uh, so what, can you tell me about that? Well, I was really angry. And so you get the sense that there's a lot of emotion, but their ability to focus that in onto something that was a real specific thing is hard. It's not what they do. They, they get caught up in the emotional state. And so for those kids, the uh, focus especially is on the triggers and helping them to understand, helping me to understand as the therapist working with them, what are the things that uh, lead to that kind of arousal. Some of the other things that we're thinking about are that some children become highly emotionally aroused when talking about triggers. So this is a point uh, in, the, in the program. So we, get, we, we know the kids some by now. We're at, uh, in the fifth and sixth sessions. We've had four sessions with them. Um, but it might well be that as we're talking about some of these uh, triggers that we'll see emotional reactions coming from the children. And that'll also be... Um, even more the case when we move into the next unit on uh, emotion regulation. So this is when your clinical skills are really important. You know, you're going to want to watch how kids are doing. You're going to you know, watch the behavior. You're going to watch their arousal. Uh, are they breathing fast or slow? Uh, because they're, we're probably going to hit close to home uh, in some of these discussions. Um, of course, our area of interest is in, is in anger. Our assumption is that... Um, some of the aggression that we're seeing in the kids that we're working with is anger-related. But uh, obviously, anger, as it gets expressed, may be masking other emotions. So there could be a child who's actually pretty depressed, and it's coming out in that irritability uh, of, of anger. So uh, as we're hearing and paying attention to their emotional states, uh, uh, it's important to think, you know, is it, what we're hearing, is it really related to something else? Uh, so um, this is listed as skills targeted. We could probably think of this as the first two things as um, really being a framework that we're trying to set up uh, throughout these two sessions. And then the next three things are really the skills. And um, so we want to convey to kids through what we say and through how we act through these sessions that feelings aren't good or bad, right or wrong. Um, and as we talk about feelings, we're going to start talking about things other than anger, so that makes it a little bit easier. We're going to talk about fear or, or sadness. But even when we want to get to anger, the um, message that we want to come through is that we all get angry, that I get angry, everybody gets angry. It's, it's an a emotion that we experience in response to having some of our goals blocked. And... Uh, and uh, even though we don't get into this discussion with the kids, we know that, in fact, anger serves really positive functions. You know, that uh, some of the very important things that happen in our society occur because people get angry, and that motivates them to uh, engage in efforts to change things. So, so even though I'm not going to say that directly to the kids, right, but in the back of my mind I know that, and I, we want to convey that uh, issue to them. And instead, it's the way we handle our feelings. So it's how does, so uh, being angry uh, is something we all experience. But what we're going to want to talk about in these sessions over the next few weeks is how is it that we can uh, express that? How can we get that across? What can we do with that feeling? And how can we, what, we can, what can we do with it in such a way that uh, ultimately you don't get in as much trouble? So um, in these two sessions, some of the skills then are identifying different types of feelings. So we're going to go through uh, a bit of 
uh, emotions. There's only a couple sessions here, so it's only so much of this. Uh, and then particularly, we're going to learn to identify different levels of feelings. That's an important uh, target. And then we're going to identify uh, triggers that are attached to those different levels. That's kind of the sequence that we'll go through. So uh, we begin by brainstorming a list of emotions. We have some discussions about what kind of emotions people have. There are a couple things in the um, workbook here that can be used as tools, um, and it just depends on how your group is doing and how talkative they are, uh, how much they can do this on their own without pictures, or if not, uh, if they're kind of concrete, then these are useful. So this is a, what emotion is this? I suspect each of you have some something like this in your own office that's kind of like this, uh, that has pictures of something with different face, facial expressions. Uh, it's a good way to get into this because it's easy. Um, almost all kids like to do it. They like to try to come up with names for different emotions. So it, and it conveys this notion that we're really interested in all kinds of emotions. It's not just one kind of emotion. Uh, there's another, um, uh, on page uh, 20, so the next page after that in the workbook, there's a uh, worksheet where kids are, uh, so we talk about emotions as being things inside of us, and sometimes when the, when the stopper's on top, uh, it gets all fizzy inside. It feels like it's about ready to explode out the top. Um, and then we ask kids to begin talking about the kinds of emotions that they experience. And uh, to the degree they're able to do writing, we can actually begin to keep, uh, ask them to keep a list of those. So our goal here is to open it up, uh, talk about uh, different kinds of emotions. And then um, as we uh, analyze the emotion, we're going to be good cognitive behavioral people. So we're going to pay attention to cognitions, to behavior, and to emotion or essentially to physiology. So that's what we want to talk about. So how do I feel inside, right, physiology? What can people see, the behavior? And what are the thoughts inside my head? And um, kind of a good way to do this is just to take some of these emotions that kids are talking about or that we put up ourselves. And if you have a whiteboard in your office or uh, if not, just if you have a sheet of paper that you can draw on in front, and have these three columns. So what people can see, the behavioral side, what you feel inside your body, and thoughts in your head. So if you think about um, the emotion that we're going to first talk about is scared. So what, what can people see when someone's scared? They shaky. They shaky. What else? Facial expression, how? Can you show me? Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of scared, okay. <laughs> okay, so facial expression, shaky. Maybe hmm? tears. Tears, yep. So that'd be uh, very overt uh, on the outside. Body tense, okay. Mm -hmm. So I might notice that you were looking really relaxed and all of a sudden things got real stiff and tight. As a good clinician, you do that all the time, right? You know, you, you know you've hit an important point once the child kind of gets all tight. You know? um, okay, what you feel inside your body when you're scared? Heart. Heart. Man, it's heart. It's kind of beating fast. Yep. What else? Muscles tight. Muscles could be tight. Tightness in their throat when they're scared. Uh huh. Okay, throat and. Mm -hmm. Can't okay, so can't breathe. Stomach ache. Stomach ache. Mm -hmm. So um, what you described is, ju is just about every system in the body, right? <laughs> and and that's about it, right? Because what is uh, when somebody is really afraid, <clears throat> if the fight or flight uh, mechanisms have have um, come into action. And that does, it affects the sympathetic nervous system, affects the parasympathetic nervous system. So, so all aspects of the body is ready to uh, flee or to fight at that time. Uh, thoughts in your head, so thoughts in your head would depend upon the particular situation probably that made you um, scared. So if we 
Uh, so that was scared. Let's say we say the emotion is anger. Okay. So what would you see? What would you see if uh, someone was angry? Okay. Knitted eyebrows. Yeah, I don't know. You might be doing throwing things. Okay, it could be very overt. Could be throwing things. Could be a fist coming through the. Yeah, something. It could be anything like that. So it could be face. Could be something about the body. Right. Could be just fists going up. Right. Face turning red. Could be face turning red. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. What about inside? What inside inside your body? What do you feel when you're angry? Okay, get very hot. Your blood goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. That would be your heart rate goes up. What else happens? Heavy breathing. Heavy breathing. What else? Your heart's racing. Yeah, heart's racing. Okay, what else? Face is flushed. So, right. So, you can see the color, and that's happening because of your cardiovascular response. You're sweating. Somebody said that? Yep. So, you're, so that's the sympathetic nervous system <clears throat> uh, kicking in at that point. So, muscles are tight. So, almost every one of those things were how you described scared, right? So, this is uh, one of the points you want to make, is that for uh, certain feelings, your body has um, similar reactions. And that, uh, again, if you think about the flight, flight sort of mechanism, well, that's, again, for a good reason. You're either mobilizing to engage in fight or to flee that situation. Um, so, um, some of the things that we're wanting to have kids talk about is can you always tell when someone is, what is someone is feeling by how they look or what they do? Right, and the answer would be no. And, and actually the kids that we work with in middle to late childhood are just getting to that point where they're, where they're starting to get better at masking emotions. So if you actually work with four or five year olds, uh, you can tell. <laughs> what they feel, almost always. You know, it's, it's pretty transparent. But this is a normal developmental skill that kids begin to master, that they mask emotions, probably boys more than girls. You know, that uh, boys learn not to look vulnerable uh, through this period of time. And uh, they may or may not be aware that, that other people are learning that same thing. Um, are you always able to express your feelings? We want kids to talk about how some feelings are probably hard to talk about some, some pretty easy. Um, so um, we want the kids to, in particular, focus on anger. So what are, in this that middle column about what your body feels, I think, is real key, because it's concrete, it's really there, and what we want the kids to begin thinking about is what are the early warning sides inside of my own body, sweating, uh, uh, heart beating fast, whatever it is, that I first start noticing when I begin to get angry because that's an early warning sign. And if I can recognize within myself that early warning sign of that emotion that's coming on, then uh, it's easier for me to do something to manage it when it's an early warning sign. So what are, what are those uh, lower level early warning signs that I, I get? Jimmy, you can just sit there until you finish your homework. You know the rules. No more television until you finish your homework. Now, I don't want to hear another excuse. Angry, huh? Yeah. I could tell that you were. How do you know? I could tell by the way you looked and the way you acted. I could see how tight your muscles were. You had your fists clenched up. And you had your teeth clenched, too. Yeah. You're also kind of frowning, you know, squinting at your mother when she left. You had your mouth kind of turned down, and your face muscles were tight, too. Yeah. I bet your heart was beating fast. You were probably breathing hard, also. How do you know? I figured as much. Often when people are angry, they show some or all of these signs. So if I think someone is getting angry, I usually check with them. Why don't I name these things again, and you show me how these look, and you can tell for yourself how they feel. All right? Yeah. How about tight muscles? What about clenched teeth? Frowning? Hands in a fist? 
See how it feels to be breathing hard? And your stomach was turning. But your heart was pounding too. Now when you begin to notice that you're feeling some of these things, these are signals, especially if something has just happened to you that you're angry about. You can bet you're probably angry if you're feeling that. Yeah. What were some of the things you were thinking while this was going on? Well, I hate my mom. I hate my teacher for making me do work. So you hate your mom and you hate your teacher for making you, you do the work and not be able to watch TV? Yeah. What else were you angry about? I hate staying in the room and I hate when I can't go outside. Uh-huh. So you hated staying in the room and not being able to go outside. So these were your angry thoughts, huh? Yeah. But even though you were having these angry thoughts and feelings, you were still going to have to do your homework, right? Yeah. So what are some of the things you might have told yourself that would have made it easier for you to control your anger? You know, so you could have finished your homework sooner and you could have gotten to watch TV. Don't, don't get mad at my mom or my teacher. Don't sweat it, because if I do my homework, I'll be able to go outside and play and watch TV. Okay, so the quicker you do your homework, the quicker you get to watch TV. What else you, could you have told yourself? My mom was, was best for me, and she was best for me, because when I grow up, she wanted me to have an education, and she wanted me, when I grow up, she wanted me to have a good job. Okay, so if you feel yourself showing any of the signs of anger when something happens to you, you ought to be careful of the things that you're telling yourself or thinking to yourself. And maybe you could tell yourself some of these things to calm yourself down, right? Yeah. Well, is there anything else that, that you want to tell me about, Jimmy? Get out. I'm trying to do my, I'm doing my homework so I can get outside. Okay, well, hey, I'll let you get to work. Thanks for talking with me, and... Uh, Good luck on controlling your anger. Okay, now you can get out. All right. Okay, so uh, angry thoughts. What were they? I hate my mom, hate my teacher for making me do all this stuff, right? So, so um, uh, when we use this as an example, we talk about how those angry thoughts are what helps to keep the anger going. So as you keep thinking about the angry thoughts, you keep being angry. Right? That's a function of an angry thought. And then there were examples in here of coping statements, coping thoughts, right? So what were they? Right. So, and that's a good one, because if I get done with my homework, then I get to go outside, which is a reinforcing activity and um, would, be, would be pleasant for me. So it's something I can think about as a thought. So what we see here with Sutan are um, illustrations of uh, the behavioral manifestation of the physiological reaction and of these cognitions that you could have that uh, are related to anger. And um, kids, uh, when we use this, and kids usually like it, and I think he's a little bit sassy at the end there, so that they like that part. Uh, so these are the kind of things that you would then cover uh, as representations of um, signs of anger, some of the behaviors, some of the internal states, and then those, uh, of course, those angry cognitions. So um, we move from there then into talking about um, anger as emotion and using an anger thermometer. Uh, how many of you use anger thermometers? Okay. How many, if you don't use anger thermometers, do you use emotion thermometers? Yeah. So you, um, you can use uh, these kind of thermometers for anxiety or depression or, or whatever, but they're really good for, for anger here, for what we're trying to get across with these kids. Very, very helpful. So in the, um, in the workbook here, there are a couple things. So there's an example of the thermometer that you could use, that you could have the kids use. And then um, uh, there's also on page, that's on page 24. That's just an example of a thermometer. And then one of the first uh, important worksheets here is, is uh, 25. And um, uh, here we're going to want kids to begin to identify, put in words that represent really high anger, really low anger, and words that represent these in-between steps. OK? 
Okay? So an important construct that we're trying to work with here is identifying different levels of anger. So our assumption is, is that for many of the kids that we work with, they in fact uh, know the concept of anger quite well. But it's kind of like I'm angry or not angry. So something happens, somebody's in my face, um, they say something about my mother, about my mama, uh, whatever, <clears throat> I'm angry. Uh, other times, uh, it's not so clear. So we want them, in fact, to become clearer that um, there's the really high level of anger, but then there's medium levels of anger and especially low levels of anger. So the words that they ultimately use to uh, represent a low level of anger, it may or may not be frustrated. It could be anything as far as I care. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't care about the vocabulary. I just want them to have a tag, a label, for how they would think about that low level of anger, high level of anger, and these steps that are in between. Um, so to help them think about um, having some of the words they can put into that thermometer, there is a worksheet on page 23 that have uh, different uh, synonyms or related words for anger as well as for happiness and sadness, but it's ones for anger that are helpful. And um, so kids can look at that. They can help, that can help them to think about what are some of these um, different levels, ways to characterize different levels of anger. Um, there are some children, I think, that are verbally compromised enough where uh, just about as far as you're ever going to get them is to talk about very high, high, medium, low, and very low anger. And even though I'd rather not leave it there, that's not so bad. If they at least get that, then they understand the sense of this gradation that occurs. Um, and then there's a homework activity, and this comes up on, uh, on the workbook on pages 26 and 27. Uh, so we want children to track across a week here, um, once each day, to circle how high their anger was. So at a time that day on Monday when I was angry, indicate uh, how angry I felt. And then on the right-hand side, to write in, why am I angry? So what was the situation? Essentially, what was the trigger that led me to feel that way? And um, what we would like to begin to emerge from that for each child is something like this, where we get a feel for what are some of the triggers that are related to very high levels of anger, what are some of the triggers that are related to middle, what are some of the triggers triggers that relate to low. So enraged and furious on thir Thursday, uh, Jeff made fun of my mom. So I was really, really, I was at the top of my thermometer. Um, on Wednesday, I couldn't figure out a math problem. And I was kind of frustrated on that day. So sort of upset. Um, steaming mad, kind of in the middle. The teacher yelled at me in front of the class on Tuesday. So <clears throat> in this example, it's looking kind of like interpersonal provocations are things that lead to higher levels of anger, and some of the frustrating things are more related to schoolwork. Yeah? Um, and I know you're working very closely with teachers in the school. Yeah. The situations like the teacher yelled at me in front of the class. Yep. I'm assuming that that's a, maybe not steaming mad, but that's a reaction that I would get upset if my superior came and got upset by my teacher. Yeah. So would that be something you would go back to your teacher and say, Delicately, yes, and very carefully, you know. <laughs> I, I, well, I know, but I mean, this is the child that's having yeah. this kind of behavior, and then if you look right. at it, like, No, I, I, th I think it's, it's very important information, and I would want to go talk to the teacher, but um, I'm, also, I'm aware on the one hand that the child's report may not be accurate. <clears throat> the child could be distorted in what they're perceiving or reporting, so I don't know what, the, what really the teacher did. But I do know that at least the child was upset. And that, it, that's, that would be the reason to go talk to the teacher, let the teacher know that the child seems to care about, you know, I try to reframe that as positively as possible. Yep, no, I, but I would agree with the point. Yep. You can't figure out something in math or just try to think that you know what triggers and you 
Yep. Especially that, yeah, in this kind of example, there, as it turns out, there's a whole bunch of things that are school related. So these would be good ones to go back and talk to that teacher about. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree. But, but in that, but we see that a lot. Like we do. Yeah. We do. And so we're going to, once we get into talking about perspective taking, one of the things that we'll talk about there is that, um, and we're going to talk about that hostile attributional bias, is that um, usually we think of that in terms of the kids' reactions with their peers. Uh, but it's not unusual to have these kids uh, feel like their teacher is out to get them, and and where they're not always accurate. You know that some some few things happen, and then pretty soon everything that happens, the teacher is out to get me. So uh, when we get to that unit, in addition to some activities that are very peer oriented, we're actually going to have a teacher activity there, something focused. We hope on that kind of attribution process towards teachers. So. So we want to attack this in several different ways. We want to think about this as possibly a distortion within the child, feel something with that. And then we want to talk with the teacher because it could well be at least based in, in part or all, in fact. So. Well, and again, I know it doesn't always happen, but I know when I did observations when we go into one of the classroom settings, there are situations where, you know, this might just happen, but the teacher will always be the you know, we get the call that, oh, the child is acting out, and teacher's there, and you're around, and when you actually go to the classroom, it's actually, I mean, yes, we understand the child's kind of worked out, but at the same time, there, there is a set up within the classroom that's not that's kind of triggering behavior. Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think we go into this, um, you know, as clinicians, realizing that almost everything has some bi-directional effects, you know, so that the child is having certain behavioral reactions. It's at least partly due to whatever is going on around the child. So if there's a way to help that teacher to present the information uh, differently. But you're exactly right. So, so this activity can be useful. You know, We're framing it as this is a way it's going to lead into anger management, so some work on the kids and what they can do to manage things. But uh, it could also lead you into environmental action you know, and dealing with the, uh, the cause of that stress. Um, so we want to identify triggers for each level of the thermometer, and we're going. That's going to be very helpful once we have some idea of what some of these triggers are later on, soon when we get into problem solving. Because uh, when we get into problem solving, when we first problem solve with kids, we want to start with uh, triggers or situations that are at the low end of the thermometer. So we want to have that in mind for all of our kids and um, realize that's where we want to start once we get there. And focus on anger management skills. We're going to focus on social problem solving skills. And um, as we do that, uh, we're hoping that we're going to see improvement in each of our kids in terms of how they practice anger management, in terms of how they think about problem solving. Uh, it won't be surprising that they're not all carrying it out to the real world. There's some reasons for that. What, what would be the reasons you think about? What is it? Immediate? So there's something immediate in the moment that uh, is going to be more reinforcing in that moment, in the immediate moment to act. And that, right, so may give you status or power or whatever. Your certain dominance goal gets fed. That might be part of it. Um, so we were talking earlier today about the issue about deliberate versus automatic stuff and that uh, kids can kind of learn stuff deliberately, but in the moment, they haven't learned how to access that automatically yet. So sometimes it's not kind of a conscious thing. It's just that they're still stuck in that same automatic way of responding. And that with further practice, they might get better. So kind of, I would think about both of these things, practice and then thinking about what are the consequences or the contingencies that are going on that maintain it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you're carrying that around with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think I think I think that some, things like that are nice physical representations. 
Um, and they can stick in kids' minds actually better than just the discussion of it. So I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. How do you cope with this in the context of what you're doing here? So, if you were uh, sensing that what that there's this powerful peer effect that's um, getting in the way of kids trying out a new skill that they're learning, whatever that skill might be in the group. Uh, so one thing, one thing that you're going to do that this program does uh, near the end is it begins to focus on identifying less deviant, less toxic peers, uh, kind of trying to identify who are the cliques, who are the groups that function in your class and your grade at school, and then identifying where you fit, where you fit currently, and then where you might fit. And uh, if I felt that this was an important dynamic, I would bring that forward and start trying to do that earlier rather than wait till the end. Yeah. So, in other, like, to take that example, for example, a kid who might get into fights a lot in PE, you would suggest, well, who are the friends that you tend not to get in fights with, and then say, who can you avoid so you could practice right. more on... So yeah, so, so, so towards the end of the program, you're, it's going to naturally get into that, but there's no reason... Makes a lot of sense to bring it in early if you need to. So, if you're if you're hanging out with a less aggressive kid, um, that's going to reduce your likelihood of having fights. Actually, if even just having a friend around it helps you uh, keep from being victimized. So, so you can if if you sense that's an important dynamic, it makes sense to you know begin working with the child about that. So, I think that this issue. This is a, I can, it's a basic issue of how do we um, help kids take things that they're learning in the group or that they're uh, changing internally, begin to transform into behavior outside. So I think that this is going to be a theme that we want to keep going over today and then tomorrow.